got um, uh, the pleasure of introducing Simon Carriage. Uh, Dr. Simon Carriage has over 25 years of experience in research management and administration and has headed up a couple of research support offices in the United Kingdom, a ARMA board, and is currently on the, Europe on the European board. So these are the research administration and management professional societies uh, in Europe. He has represented widely and written a little, I wouldn't say a little, Simon, okay. He has written uh, and would love to talk acronyms such as RAP, CREDIT, and JORMA. Simon lives in the southeast of England and relaxes by walking his four dogs. Uh, Simon and I have, have uh, had the opportunity to work together on several occasions and it has always been an extreme pleasure. Um, it, he is joined this morning by Melinda Fisher. Melinda has over 10 years experience as a research administrator and has worked in both pre and post award positions. She holds both a CRA and a CPRA and has presented nationally for INCURA and SRAI on various research administration topics. She is living on a farm in the National Forest of South Carolina. Melinda enjoys whitewater kayaking, gardening, and hanging out with the family's three dogs, eight cats, and 18 chickens. I think that trumps the four dogs, Simon, I'm not sure. Uh, but she works at Clemson, so that's a that's an ag school, a land-grant school, so of course she uh, knows, uh, knows a lot about uh, it, having a, a herd of animals. <laughs> so um, I, I, I don't know, it, we had two other speakers that were going to be joining us this morning, but uh, we are unsure if, oh wait, there's Maduri. She is Oh, here. hi Maduri. <laughs> so let me also introduce Maduri. Um, Maduri Duda is presently the head of uh, Center of Operational Research Excellence, which is uh, acronym CORE India at the George Institute for Global Health India. She has a PhD in life science and a decade of research management experience from her previous positions as grants advisor at the DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance and head of research administrations in three public health research institutes in India. She has contributed to several courses, workshops, and training programs in research skills for early career researchers. Maduri is interested in creating institutional processes that facilitate an enabling research environment. She is an Indian Research Management Initiative Fellow supported by the DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance. So welcome, Maduri. I'm so glad that you were able to join us. It, for, for us uh, here in Orlando, it's nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, just to put everybody sort of in context, uh, Majuri, what time is it in India right now? Uh, it's 7.37 p.m. in the evening, so okay. seven, just a little bit after 7.30. Okay, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And Simon, what time is it there in uh, the UK? I've got absolutely no idea. Uh, I just live in the US time. No, it's just a little bit after two, but you'll notice that Maduri lives in a weird time zone. It's like a half hour time zone. That just makes it really confusing. I don't know how her brain works at all. <laughs> and and Melinda is is uh, also on Eastern time. So uh, we, we have some folks here that are um, from other parts of the United States, which are also in different time zones, and as I said, in, in countries around the world. So I want to thank you all. And uh, with this, I want to, uh, and I, uh, I believe Chris, Christina is not going to be joining us this morning. Is that correct? Well, I'm not sure. I've just seen in the chat somebody saying, uh, oh, hi, Christina. No, uh, something about Madeira, but it's just because that's Portugal, but it might be an entirely different Christina, right? 
Well, I, I think that they're assuming that Christina is here. That was the way I interpreted that. Unfortunately, oh, okay. Christina, Christina's been ill, and so I doubt that she'll be with us today. Okay, okay. All right. Well, um, it, it, I'm sure she still contributed uh, to the presentation. And with that, I uh, want to remind everyone that uh, you will be on mute during the uh, presentation, but please feel free to put your comments and your questions in the chat. We have a chat monitor, uh, and so we'll address those questions um, either at the end or if one of the speakers happens to see it and they want to address it at that time, they will. Um, also, uh, keep your video off if you don't mind, and that will give us more bandwidth, and uh, everyone will be receiving a uh, link to a copy of this presentation along with um, the handouts uh, at the end of, of the conference. So sometime in February. So with that, I'm turning it over, turning my mic off. <laughs> uh, thanks, Jennifer. And just to say, if anyone has any difficult questions, then we won't be answering those ones. Uh, so yeah, uh, Hi, everybody. Uh, you, you've had the introduction, so thank you very much to uh, the extraordinarily uh, talented Jennifer, who knows everything and has done everything, and I feel just a little bit beholden to her. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Simon. Um, on my screen, I've got Melinda and uh, Madori. Um, we will be uh, giving you, you this a lovely presentation. Um, as Jennifer said, uh, questions in chat, we will pick them up. Um, other than that, We've only got like 50 minutes or so, so we probably just kind of should scoot on, right? Uh, let's see if I can work out how to advance the slide. Wow. There we go. So in our presentation, we are going to share a little bit about the surveys that Simon and various colleagues, one of whom is Jennifer, have designed and administered over the past six years. Um, RAP research administration as a profession. Um, we will discuss a high level overview of the first and second iterations of the questionnaire and then dive into what the third installment, which launched yesterday, happy launch day, is investigating. Uh, and as Jennifer said, if you have questions um, during the presentation, please feel free to drop them in the chat and we will try to respond. Uh, and just to say, you're probably going to be hearing mainly from me and Melinda, or Melinda and I, that's terrible, isn't it? No, me and Melinda, uh, because uh, Maduri has been a little bit poorly and she's still got a, a croaky throat. Um, in fact, that's Maduri and Chris. I'm a little bit worried about who's going to be next. We'll, we'll be fine for the next hour. We'll survive. Don't worry. Okay, so uh, here is the big, horrible slide with too much writing, but lots of photos. Um, so just to uh, give you sort of the bigger picture about uh, about rap as uh, Melinda talked about don't worry we're not going to actually do a rap because that would be horrific um, so uh, 2015 um, got some funding from Incura thank you very much uh, to to run a survey uh, that survey was actually by the time we actually got to run it uh, run in, in in 2016 so that was the first time the rap survey was run we thought maybe we'll get a thousand responses that would be amazing we got 2690 responses we we're absolutely over the moon about it and we then realized we then had a whole load of analyses to do um to uh, to thank everyone for for providing that information in their time um this was then picked up by inorms inorms is the international network of research management society so association of associations if you like uh, and they said yeah we, we like what you've done do you fancy doing it again uh, we don't have any money but we know that you'll do it from the goodness of your heart so obviously being a research manager administrator i said yes um uh, found some extra foolish people uh, jennifer was one of those to uh, put their time into this project um, and we developed a second, second iteration of the survey, uh, which asked more or less the same questions, the same sort of, sort of subset of questions to do with um, demographics and so on, um, and had a particular focus on uh, research impact. The first survey had had a focus on uh, the skills that research managers and administrators need. Um, 
that's got 4,325 well, five responses, but we had to take one out because it was a duplicate response. So that, that was a bit of a shame because 4,325 was a nice number, 4,324 just not quite as appealing as a number. Uh, so again, um, you know, a huge number of responses, more than we could possibly have imagined. The survey went out to approximately 25 to 30,000 people. So that's a pretty good uh, response rate. Um, we have had some additional follow-on funding uh, from Cura to do some analyses. Um, we are uh, still uh, spending that money, yay, thanks very much, um, and haven't yet produced those analyses, but those are to come. Uh, but we also decided, well, 2016, 2019, that's three years, 2022, yeah, let's run a third survey. So uh, the third survey is what's been mentioned already, and we'll have plenty more to say about that at the end. Um, but kind of the focus of this presentation, the first half of it will be some results from the RAP2 survey. Um, that second survey, although it took place in 2019, anyone remember there was something happened in 2020, 2021, can't remember what else still happening, some sort of pan fried dish or something like that. Um, so yeah, uh, those analyses and data cleansing took a little bit longer, but the the data has now been all approved and signed off. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and uh, is now available for people to use, uh, including ourselves, to to produce those analyses. So here you see uh, some some first uh, sort of results, um, and of course you have the uh, the lovely dream team of uh, Midori, Melinda, and Christina um, to, uh, to to sort of um, help on this third iteration. So. Um, Next slide, then. I think I've, I'm tired of talking. I'll, I'll ask Melinda. So you can see from the responses here that the number of respondents almost doubled between RAP1 and RAP2. And the percentage of U.S. participants stayed pretty steady. Um, we represented about 35% of the responses in 2016 and about 33 in 2019. Hopefully, the RAP3 that was released yesterday um, will see more U.S. respondents than uh, we did in RAPS 1 and 2. Um, it's only been a day since it opened, and we have 80 respondents already, mostly from Australia. 81? 81. 81. No, it's 81. It's, 80, it's, it's 81 now. I haven't checked in the last minute, but I'm, it'll be more by the end of the, the hour. That's right. So I, I you know, selfishly, I'm hoping that um, my colleagues here in the U.S. will step up and, and bump that up into the 40s of uh, percentages. So, but we did, you know, obviously it's a, it's a nice breakdown there. We did well. And uh, speaking of breakdowns, that's just about what it causes as well. Uh, no, the survey's not that long. I mean, for us trying to anal uh, anal and analyze, analyze it. <laughs> Okay. So, so here, here's where we uh, tempt fate and try and uh, switch from uh, Zoom to Slido. Uh, you might be able to start the screen share while mine is still on because that worked for me. Um, so Melinda is going to uh, um, uh, sort of run the, run the uh, the Slido. But if you've got um, a uh, QR code scanner. Um, then uh, you can scan that code, but of course you can't now because it's off. And it's now, it's back, fantastic. All right, look at that. Love this. So if you have a smartphone, just aim your camera at the QR code if you haven't already. And let's see where everybody's from. Yeah, Simon, are you gonna chime in? No, I'm, I'm trying to scan my smartphone because I don't want everything to be a US state. I, I'm, I'm gonna pick the, the bottom option, which looks far more important which is uh, something like, I come from somewhere more interesting, uh, outside the US, sorry. And do you scroll all the way to the bottom to hit send after you've selected your state, territory, or other? Yeah. Wow, well, it's, it's a huge surprise to see so many people from Florida. I mean, it's virtual, they could be from anywhere, right? I guess the marketing was fairly Florida-based. There's a clue in the title of the session, right? Look at Massachusetts, goodness. Wow. wow, so many teeth. Simon, there's a question. Uh, how do people who work remotely answer? Uh, uh -huh. Elizabeth lives in one state but works for a university in another state. Well, that is a good question. Um, it, we are looking here for the uh, location of the place that employs you. 
I guess we should have reworded that too. Where is yeah? If only we knew something about it. questionnaires, right? Yeah. Okay, it looks like we've pretty much leveled out now. 163 responses. Florida is the overwhelming location, but as you can see, Jennifer, that should make you happy. Looks like you've got people from all over. Wow. More people who don't work in the US than people from these states. That's amazing. That could just be Simon and Maduri though. What, 2%? <laughs> yeah, it probably is, right? <laughs> okay. All right, do you wanna take back over the- I will do my best sorry we're not as smooth at this no no if you hadn't told them that they would think that we were being smooth about it right um i wonder if i get the right screen share how does that look okay so we've had the results of that poll uh unsurprisingly sorry that was my cue to hand over to you melinda <laughs> unsurprisingly um we, it looks like we have a pretty general uh, Florida respondent rate here, but um, as you can see from the RAP responses, I know this kaleidoscope, these kaleidoscopes are really hard to see, um, this, the different states, but California being, California and Texas being our largest states, not surprisingly, have the, the highest number of responses. Um, followed by New York and North Carolina. It's pretty well, I mean, you can see that it, did, it didn't change a whole lot for the top three. Um, Florida is always pretty high up there in the rankings, North Carolina as well. Um, but it'll be really interesting to see which states and territories take over in RAP3. Absolutely. And uh, just in case you wanted more information about states, it's not exactly more information, is it? It's kind of it's just displayed differently, but you can see, and I keep forgetting that you can't see my mouse, but you can see <laughs> that, that Florida respondents did go up just a little bit. There were some surprises, like if you look at Texas, you can see that not nearly as many people responded from Texas, um, but then there were some, um, some increases from the other direction too. So like New York really grew in their responses and Washington, Maryland, um, Oklahoma. So it'll it'll be interesting to see what we get for RAP3. Uh, and sorry, uh, Melinda, but I think the New, New York one went down as well, so same as Texas. Uh, but actually the numbers might actually be slightly higher because we, overall we had more responses, but, but uh, yeah. But I mean, this, it, it shows a fairly stable picture though. So this is perhaps a, a reasonable snapshot of the proportion of research managers and administrators, sorry, research administrators, I forgot what country I was in. Uh, there are uh, spread across the, uh, uh, the, uh, the US. Yeah, and shout out to Tennessee, goodness. They grew a lot in 2019. Wow, yeah, that's true. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, well, we'll see who's the big winners for RAP3, right? Okay, so now we have the uh, aforementioned promised uh, RAP2 data. Um, you'll get all the slides afterwards, of course, so I'll try not to um, uh, spend too much time going through them. I guess if you've got a particular interest or question, then you know, maybe slap it in the chat and we can pick it up at the end or, or, or as we go. Um, hopefully they are sort of recognizable in terms of the information they're trying to, to put across. So here we're looking at the RAP2 uh, data. This is the 1400 respondents from the US, uh, just to say that you know, you've got about 10% from uh, PUIs, uh, the red is R2, so uh, that's a third, and then uh, well, almost a half from research intensive, and then uh, research institutes, hospitals, charities, and so on. Uh, that's R1, sorry, research intensive, thank you, yes. So this is uh, R2, and I was really hoping there was going to be D2, but yeah, never mind. Come on. <laughs> and who is this lovely pup? Uh, this is a beautiful daughter of uh, Chloe, who is the uh, oldest of my four doggies. And um, while we're doing that, I think it must be time for another poll. So uh, this is almost certainly the quickest one to answer. Um, 
how do you identify? Do you identify as female, as male, as non-binary, or actually prefer not to say? Of course, prefer not to say, you could just not fill it in, but you also might want to fill in prefer not to say. So how are we going? Huh. I thought I'd better vote just to show that, you know, there's at least <laughs> a couple. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Holy moly. So I was going to say that 92% dropped to 90%, which just meant that, you know, women in general were more able to vote more quickly, but no, it stayed up there. So that, that, that theory is out of the window. That's a high proportion of females. Yes, it is. That's very high. It looks like we're steady now. Yeah. Okay, I will uh, zip her back then. So uh, yeah, if you can remember the details of that, it's very difficult because you know, there was a lot of information going on there. Um, but uh, yeah, basically that's what 90% female. Um, if we look at uh, the data from the RAP survey, um, then RAP1, RAP2, you can see it's practically the same uh, response rate there, 78% um, uh, female. Uh, so we have a higher proportion of females here than we might have expected. Um, I don't know. Any theories, Melinda? <laughs> um, I think that I, I do have a lot of theories. I'm not sure I should discuss them here, but I do think that there is something to, you know, new um, professional um, positions typically being male dominated in the beginning. And then, you know, as it moves on, um, kind of like teachers, it seems like um, males tend to move out of the profession when females start coming into it. So, and I Adori, just, just shout out, interrupt us. You don't need to put your hand up. Uh, no, I just wanted to say maybe uh, facilitation and support comes naturally to women. So, could be. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, I, I, so I have to say, I, I agree with that view as well. I think that uh, in general, we are a supportive uh, profession and can, could perhaps be uh, aligned with nursing as a profession because it's very much a supporting service culture, um, which perhaps um, is something which are, are, are more uh, female attributes. Um, so, but yeah, the, my actual question though, Melinda, was uh, why have we got 90% on this call uh, as opposed to only 78%, but you know, it, the numbers aren't so huge. There are um, more females in Florida? Uh, yeah, obviously. I thought there were more flamingos in Florida, but yeah, fine. Okay, so uh, here we have then, uh, yeah, and sorry, uh, question, should we really be assigning uh, traits to gender? Um, we probably shouldn't be. However, um, that's the only explanation I can come up with at the moment as to why the profession is more attractive for, uh, for those people who identify as female as opposed to those people who identify as male. Um, open to other suggestions. Uh, yeah, so just to show you, there is a difference in the gender breakdown by different regions of the world. Um, so USA, this was practically um, that same result we've just seen because of a large number of respondents, uh, pretty similar for most other places, but the rest of the world, which is basically Africa and Asia, uh, is more of a 50-50 split. And the suggestion behind this is that uh, a lot of the profession are actually researchers who are moving directly into research administration or potentially doing research administration at the same time. And uh, research more generally um, is uh, more of a male dominated profession. So that perhaps you know, uh, you know, counteracts the, the other driver. So again, just hypotheses at this stage and we'll be looking forward to uh, people exploring those in more depth. By the way, that um, the dog on the screen there is Molly, a female. Mm -hmm. Okay, Molly, um, who identifies as female. Um, in terms of your, uh, your, your current role, where you were you a leader, manager, operational staff? Again, this is just to give you an idea of the types of, uh, of, of people that responded to the survey. So um, hopefully a good mix. And uh, if we're naming dogs, uh, then that's Violet um, and in the background, Gracie. Mm -hmm.
So uh, back to uh, the gender issue. Um, this is the same data, but shown uh, two ways round. I guess the bottom right hand one um, is the one which should be depressing. Um, for operational staff, you can see that uh, approximately 20% um, are male. 80% identify as female and by the time you get up to the leadership positions um, then that's closer to a 30-70% split so definite evidence for a glass ceiling um, yeah it's not great news I have seen worse graphs than that for other professions but it's still not good we have work to do yeah Um, similarly, in terms of whether or not somebody has a permanent, a, an open-ended position or some sort of fixed term position, then the permanent is in blue. Uh, leaders are more likely to be in permanent positions, so perhaps there is a bit less job security in, in operational positions. Um, again, perhaps not unsurprising, some of these might be project-based, but maybe not such a, a great idea. Well, I think too that for the US anyway, um most of these positions, not all of course, are in um, institutions, many of which are public institutions of higher ed and, you know, probably have more full-time people than they do part-time people. Mm -hmm. um, now looking at uh, whether or not your role uh, is properly described in your job description uh, is a bit of a mixed bag here. Um, that's uh, sort of 60-ish percent um, of, uh, of people at various levels um, say that yes, uh, their job description you know, um, does match what they do. Um, and 45% uh, say, well, there's some match. There are very few in the green here who say, actually, no, I'm doing something else entirely. Um, maybe there's a slight peak in managerial because people in those positions at that level perhaps get pulled off onto projects or something for example but again it's not a huge difference um, there are some various uh, variations um, uh, across the regions of the world but not huge variations do you think that has to do with the age of the profession in those regions yeah possibly i mean certainly us and canada the profession has been recognized for longer so perhaps uh, the roles are more tightly uh, uh, described and identified uh, and so yes there, there could be a reason for that sure um lots of color on this one so uh, uh, apologies for that uh, so here we're looking at um, educational alignment so you know if you did a, a bachelor's or a master's or, 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 or a doctorate is, is that aligned to the subject areas that, that you support so the yellow at the bottom the not applicable is well I, I kind of support the whole institution so it doesn't really matter what my background was to the uh, the blue at the top, which is, uh, uh, yes, it is, uh, you know, I got a physics degree and I'm working as a research uh, administrator in the physics department. Uh, red is, uh, yeah, a little bit, maybe there's some overlap, uh, you know, maybe you did physics and you're working in science, for example, more generally. Um, so you can see there that that rest of the world um, is different uh, in terms of there being more um, of the blue, and this perhaps supports that uh, more researchers becoming um, research administrators. Um, do you think it's important um, uh, that your your subject uh, aligns uh, with areas that you support? And again, uh, looking down at the rest of the world, then a huge proportion uh, are higher than the other areas think it is important. Um, whereas um, if you've moved to uh, sort of the US or, or, or the UK, uh, then it's, that's a smaller proportion who, who think it's important. Again, do you think that relates to the age of the profession with it beginning with researchers transitioning into research administration roles? Yeah, I think I think uh, in the US uh, and potentially in the UK, it's uh, it, it's very much seen as a professional service, um, and therefore it doesn't matter if you don't know the minutiae of the formula that, that they're talking about, because you can abstract that to provide the the help. Um, but of course, uh, the Canadian result is a little bit different because again, the, you know, the profession is quite old in Canada, so um, it maybe have slightly different structures there. Interesting. 
sorry, comment there, as much alignment uh, in my office has always been, I have no idea how I got here. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Quite a lot of people would uh, <laughs> would suggest that they kind of fell into the position and we'll come to that later, um, but maybe they fell in because, uh, the, you know, because physics was mentioned, perhaps. Um, okay, so uh, this is just the same information because uh, we have here, uh, do you think in your current role it's important to have the, the education experience aligned? Uh, so this is the, the yes, the maybe and the no. Uh, and I did this graph because I thought, well, I wonder if it's different for those people who work in the kind of the pre-award um, area as opposed to those who perhaps work on on, on, not on the post-award, on the finance side of things, because the pre-award might be closer to, to the researchers. Um, so this graph is uh, the data for just those um, who who work in, in, in pre-award. And you can see it's basically the same graph. I mean, it is actually different data. There's, you can see the slither of orange is different, but um, it really doesn't make that much difference for, for pre-award uh, either. I can't believe the kitties are getting a cute notice compared with the dogs. That's ridiculous. The sweet babies. <laughs> um, just to give you an idea, we're going to quickly skip over these slides. Um, nothing surprising but the sort of data that was in the RAP survey. Uh, so um, this one is how many roles have you had? Leaders have had more roles, unsurprising. Um, this one is um, how many roles have you had uh, compared with um, your, uh, um, uh, your experience in terms of number of years? So, uh, you know, again, more experience, more roles, uh, not a huge surprise. Um, we should do a poll for how many people have got more than 40 years of research management experience. Yeah. Uh, this one is basically just how old are you in terms of age bracket? And you can see here 24 and under is blue and that is this slither <laughs> that, that hardly exists. Um, and we have sort of, if you like, the bulk of research management administrators in the uh, uh, the green and the orange, which is 35 to 44 and 45 to 54. Um, there's quite a lot of 55s and there are some, uh, a reasonable proportion um, in the USA and the rest of the world who are uh, 65 and over. Uh, and again, unsurprisingly, uh, older people tend to be uh, in, in leadership positions. We have our work cut out for us, attracting younger people to this profession. I think that there's a um, we do not have our brand out there. You know, I don't think that mm -hmm. our profile has been raised to um, attract younger people to be intentional about coming into research administration. So yeah, if, only Sunday, if only somebody would do some sort of research into how people find their way into the profession, right? Mm. Yeah. All we need is more slides with cats and dogs. on. I think that apparently is working well. Okay, uh, so here now we're talking about academic qualifications, so attainment level. Uh, so at the bottom, uh, but again, by region, you have uh, uh, doctorates in yellow, masters, uh, bachelors in, in orange and so on. Um, and here you have it by level. So you can see uh, that those in leadership positions are more likely to have a doctorate or master's, but it's not a huge um, uh, stepping chunk there. Okay. Here we have um, any qualifications undertaken during your time as a research manager. So you, know, you might you might have done a part-time master's, for example, and that's this yellow here, doctorate underneath again, and bachelor's uh, again in orange. So uh, it's quite a large proportion, um, um, probably more leaders just because they've been around for longer, right? Um, and then similarly uh, down the bottom here uh, on the right-hand side, um, you have uh, a difference by uh, by region. So you can see a large proportion of, of masters, um, which I imagine, again, we don't, we, have, we haven't delved into the data, uh, will be uh, people doing uh, masters, perhaps uh, research administration masters, uh, whilst being a research manager. Uh, rest of the world, higher proportion of doctorates, again, thinking about the, are they active researchers who are moving to, into research administration or, or doing that at the same time? So, Time for me to take a breather. Um, let's uh, think about certification uh, rather than academic attainment. And uh, Linda has another slido for you. 
Okay, so we are looking for not academic qualifications, but professional qualifications. We've got the CRA, the Certified Research Administrator, the CFRA, the Certified Financial Research Administrator, CPRA, Certified Pre-Award Research Administrator, and I can't see below my toolbar there, but I know that we also have the um, Certified Professional um, IRB Administrator and the Certified Professional IACUC Administrator also in there. And then other, because mm -hmm. there are other things like the grants management certificates. And I know that um, Canada has its own version of the CRA, as does the UK, right? Exactly, yes. Um, then, although the CRA is, is less popular, it's uh, the CRM, which is a, a slightly higher level one, the certificate research management is, is more popular. There's also a certificate in uh, uh, the leadership and research management as well, which is a master's level qualification, and they have different ones in Australia and yeah, so on. Well, it looks like the overwhelming majority here has either none or a CRA. Mm -hmm. Well, how surprising is that? Let us see what the RAP data showed us, shall we? Yes. So, uh, that looked pretty similar to your graph. I'm quite happy with that one, right? <laughs> so, I think you had... Almost a mirror image. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In fact, I think that's, yeah, that's pretty much, we have 52% of none, and then 33% CRA, 16% mm -hmm. other. All oh, right, okay. okay. So. so there's a little change there. 4% CPRA, 1% CFRA and IRB each. And nobody is an IACUC professional on this particular mm -hmm. poll. Okay, excellent. Uh, so uh, here then is the certification graph and uh, do you have any of those certifications? Uh, red is yes and you can see that again operational staff, uh, managerial level staff and, and, and uh, research administration leaders. Um, that looks pretty similar to me uh, to uh, this one here which is the highest academic attainment. I mean it's a bigger chunk to start with um, you know starting at a higher level but those steps are about the same size so basically uh, a CRA is more or less as likely to get you promotion or be associated with higher uh, positions than uh, than getting a PhD so uh, you decide which one's uh, going to take you less time to do uh, yeah or of course, of course you could do both that's the the other option um, and just to give you an idea of the sort of uh, availability of certification obviously the CRA has been around for a lot longer in the US so roughly 40% um, are, of people from the US have any sort of certification which again is the, the poll we've just seen so quite happy with the data there um yeah okay now here's the slide which might be a bit of a surprise to you um Maduri's what, least favorite slide yeah what uh what use was this certification uh, did it help you get promotion or a new job so uh let's just look at the usa because that's where most of the people are from so there's a 10% going, oh, absolutely not. And then there's another 15% or so say, nope. Um, I, uh, 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 sorry, I'm looking, at the wrong, I'm looking at the wrong end of the slide. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, strongly disagree. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so 10%, another 10% uh, disagree. But uh, there's also a don't agree, which is, you know, this is usually associated with uh, because I haven't got one. So, um, uh, but there's also then 15% and another 10% who, who do agree either strongly. So so of the 40% who have one, only, only about 25% think it was worth doing from a promotional uh, point of view. Um, so that perhaps needs to be explored a little bit further. Um, and again, the same graph uh, down here, um, operational staff are less likely, uh, I guess, because they haven't been promoted yet, uh, than, than, than leaders to, to strongly agree. However, leaders are also more likely to strongly disagree. So again, that's, that's quite a, a strange finding. But anyway, we, we better move on because we've got plenty more to talk about. Um, 
so that's really the end of uh, RAP2. Uh, here are all the people who are involved uh, in it. Um, so you can see a cast of thousands, well, 40 in fact. Um, and uh, I have na named the people here involved in RAP3. So let's just uh, move on uh, to that. Um, oh yes, except I forgot this slide because that's how professional I am. So uh, here you can find uh, links to uh, the data from uh, RAP1 and also links to uh, RAP2. You can read about um, the uh, the first survey uh, in the research management review and you will no doubt be able to read about the second survey uh, when we finish writing about something. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. I managed to click the link rather than forward. <laughs> wow, that's pretty. Thank you. That's my farm two weeks ago during the great snowstorm of 2022. So um, we're going into what we are investigating now with RAP3, which is Hibarma, how I became a research administrator. So the survey that we launched just yesterday is asking questions, it, the, the demographic questions, the academic and professional certification questions are still there, um, but we've expanded a little bit more into um, ethnicity and race. And we've also, our guest section this time is on how people find this profession. Do you fall into it? Is it, you know, someone recommends that you might be good at this? Does someone see a job posting and just say, hey, you should really apply for this? Or is this something that you woke up one day and were just like, wow, I'm just filled with this passion to uh, facilitate research. How can I do that? And you found this profession. So um, we yeah, will yeah. continue. That, that sounds so familiar. <laughs> you just woke up and realized this is what I want to be when I grow up. Um, exactly. We're... we're we're really hoping to figure out what are the trends, how do people find research administration in different areas of the world so that we can inform the whole community and, and maybe you know answer these questions about how do we attract younger people? How do we keep people in research administration? How do we better prepare them? You know, what are the challenges? What are the barriers and what are the joys? What do people love about research administration? Uh, so, the main thing I love is the view of your farm that's no farm i've seen before <laughs> it's, it's better in the summer is it okay well here's a little view from from me so just to give you an idea of the sort of additional questions um that we're asking this time so specifically what did you do before what did you want to be as, as melinda said um what what skills you brought to the job and so on and hopefully we'll be able to um give a little more insight into how how we find ourselves here and therefore be able to attract more people what a cutie Yes, he is such a sweet baby. So um, as you take the survey, I'm going to be optimistic and assume that all of you who are here with us today are interested in informing the field and are going to follow through with completing the survey. Um, if you are willing to be contacted about your own personal interesting story, please make sure that you do enter your personal information. We are not going to collect IP addresses. We're not going to collect any kind of identifying information about who you are unless you fill this information. We would love to be able to contact you and have um, a case study, do a full interview with you because we really are interested in how people get here. Um, we're all interesting people. I don't think I've ever met a research administrator who didn't have some kind of incredible, you know, interesting fact about themselves. Um, and, and we want to know what yours is. So I don't think there will be a whole lot of fame and fortune, but there <laughs> may be a little bit of fame, no fortune, sorry. Um, and now some examples. Excellent. Uh, but I would say, of course, that if we get the same volume of responses, the chances of being selected for our interview for fame and fortune will be quite low. So uh, but, you know, who knows? If you don't buy a ticket, you don't win the lottery. Um, yeah, OK, so this is my quick story. We'll make it quick because it's very boring because I've heard it a lot of times before. Uh, so, yeah, I, I um, graduated in uh, natural sciences in 87, uh, decided I was going to make lots of money selling computer software. So I uh, did that for three years. Didn't make lots of money, but, you know, there you go. Uh, basically went back to university to work on EU projects, not because that was something that I wanted to do. It was because I saw an advert in the paper for a job and I had heard of the place that it was going to work because it was where I studied. So, you know, 
knew the employer and went back and worked for one of the lecturers um you know that that, that taught me as an undergraduate i uh, carried on working for him until 2007 um and that's what happened on the various other things. So I moved around, worked on projects, and then basically um, you know, moved into becoming a research development officer in an office of two. Uh, so I was second in charge, hashtag most junior person. Um, yeah, so that that was me basically. Um, since then, I've just headed up a, a, a sort of a couple of projects here and there and, and led a couple of areas. It's something different every day. That's why I love it. And that's why I've stayed. Even though I'm now retired, I'm still stayed. You don't seem very retired. No, no. <clears throat> so my story is very different from Simon's, which I think is why we're so focused on how people got here, because each of us on this project are all very different, different backgrounds. Um, I was a whitewater raft guide for several years and then started a family and was a stay at home mom. And then I started working for a nonprofit in 2005 and was their grant writer. And I also did their financials. So I was pre and post award, but I didn't even know it yet. Um, <laughs> Then I got a position in post-award research administration at the departmental level at Clemson. And a few years later, um, got an email from a business officer recommending me for a pre-award job. I had absolutely no idea what was happening in pre-award. Um, didn't think that I was very qualified for the job, but applied for it. Ended up getting it. Felt like I was drinking from a fire hose for the first six months and uh, told myself that I was going to stay for two years. And if I still didn't feel confident in what I was doing, I would look for something else. But I am still here and I love it. Truly think it's the best job ever. Um, I was the manager of the one college at Clemson and then um, sat for my CRA and CPRAs in 2018, got them both and then moved to a different college within Clemson. And, uh, and just, I love this job. Excellent stuff. So I think we now have our, so to speak, uh, guest speaker who's been quiet, saving her voice. Madhuri. Thank you. I wish I had interesting stories like both of you, but I was very conventional, I think very boring. So during my PhD, uh, there were no career guidance or mentoring programs. I missed the networking platforms also to interact with other PhD and postdoc students and sort of learn from them. And after I finished my postdoctoral studies, I decided to join research management. And my aim was then to facilitate capacity building and career guidance for early career researchers, including PhD students. And so after an initial stint at a funding organization, which is the Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance. So it's like a collaboration between Welcome Trust UK and Department of Biotechnology in India. I then decided to join um, a few public health research organizations and headed their research operations. And right now I head the research operations at George Institute for Global Health India, which is a, a international organization. Uh, again, with uh, regional offices in Sydney, Australia, we work with Imperial College London. Uh, we also have an office in China and we have two offices in India. So in this position, I also work with early career researchers to establish networking platforms and essentially help them in capacity building. I'm extremely fortunate that through the India Research Management Initiative, which is a very new association uh, of research managers in India, I came into contact with Simon and working with Simon, Melinda and Christina has been a blessing and a great learning experience for me. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> oh, uh, thanks, Majori. So you've taken my breath away. <laughs> um, we also uh, have a, a quick side on Christina. As mentioned, uh, she is uh, poorly at the moment, and you can guess what the poorliness was, but she is on the mend. Don't worry. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I guess... We, as we're running out of time, we should probably uh, skip over Christina rather than uh, us try and tell you uh, what her story is. But uh, you can see that it's uh, kind of a little bit different because she's gone to a funding agency um, and then to uh, and to sort of a research administration position sort of fairly, fairly quickly. So I think 
what we want to say is, uh, in summary, uh, hopefully you found some of the data interesting and you also thought hmm, it would be good if we knew something else. I've seen some things in the chat um, about it would be great to find out about these stories. So uh, if you want to take uh, the survey, you can do it now with your with this QR code. have to say it is quite a long survey, probably best not to do it on your phone. Um, you can use the uh, the link there, the bit.ly link will, will take, it to, take you to it. Of course, you, you can't do it today or tomorrow because you're going to attend the rest of the frac sessions but you know maybe next week um it, you know you don't have to do it in one sitting as long as you use the same web browser or remember where you were um and for those who are interested in uh, reading a lot um uh, then you will be delighted to know i'm sure that quite a lot of this information will end up in in a book that we've just signed a contract for um and we'll cover research management administration uh, around the world and um well, I can't tell you how much is in it because we've run out of time, but I guess what we do need to do is skip on to uh, the, uh, here's our backgrounds contact details, should you wish to uh, get in contact with us or visit those uh, websites and so on. I think we were supposed to finish about now, but I don't know, Melinda, do you have another question for people? I might, yes. So if you guys want to uh, tune in and take the quiz, hopefully this will work. I've never incorporated a quiz, just uh, polls. And I don't think that's what we're supposed to do. Does that seem right? No, that looks like you're creating a Wordle or something. <laughs> um, okay, there we go. It'll give you 15 seconds to take the quiz. 15 seconds, wow. That's- Better do Ooh. it, quick, quick, quick. I, 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 uh, um, uh. Oh, I had to sign in uh. first of all. Oh no, we didn't give enough time for the quiz. Ah. Sorry. I guess I could start it back up. Well, you could because you haven't you haven't given the uh, results away yet, have you? No. <laughs> okay. Wow, that's much better. So I've got time to do it now. Great. And there we go. Okay, so. I love that people were counting the cats. Simon was really banking on the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> None of the cats are his. I, I, I guess they weren't counting the cats. It's just they didn't want to get the number of dogs wrong. That's actually what it was. All right. Uh, I'm... I'm wondering whether anyone else has a question. Uh, I've seen lots of people uh, saying that they enjoyed the pictures. Uh, I don't know if I've missed a question. Uh, do you know or work with any Americans who've moved abroad to do research administration? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I feel I should. I know some Americans who work abroad doing research administration, but still for a US institution. Um, I know of some non-Americans who've moved to America to be research administrators. Um, hmm. Well, we have a question about uh, what country do you work in? And, we are, and, and also for RAP3, which country were you born in? And so that would answer that. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll see what that uh, mobility is like. We also be capturing state, so we can find out people who've moved states, assuming, of course, that we don't have too many people working from home and in a, in a different state. But we've got some more questions coming in. Uh, oh, no, it's Madori putting the link in. Great idea, well done. Uh, uh, website to take and prepare for the CRA. Melinda, that's a question for you. I already And you've answered it. That. Of course you have, yes. Uh, Simon made me laugh the whole time. Oh, okay, sorry, you were supposed to be paying attention. Sorry about that, Anna, but you're very I kind. See. Yes, please. Uh, wow. There are study groups you can join if you just Google it. There are also, um, for the CRA, CPRA, and CFRA, there are um, quizlets that are out there. Um, I used a couple, I designed a couple, they're all 
public. Um, those were very helpful. The, the study sessions that RAC provides periodically, usually in conjunction with um, a, an Incura conference, uh, those are very helpful. Um, yeah, agreed. Well, I don't know if we're out of time, but we're, we're, we're willing to hang around for at least another minute or two, I'm sure. Um, Jennifer, do you, have a, do you have a question for us? You, you, you're looking as if to say that was, that was perfect. Or... It was perfect. <laughs> it was perfect. <laughs> Apart from me reading one of the slides upside down. I, 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 personally, I was disappointed that there were not more chickens, but other yeah. than that, I think that it was perfect. All right. Well, the next, you'll have to tune into our lunch and learn session then. There are more chickens <laughs> in that one. So Yeah, there are. That's great. That's great. So um, I just wanted to say thank you and, and encourage everyone on the call, uh, not only to complete the survey, uh, but to also encourage others in your office that might not be participating in this to complete the survey. Not even in your office, anyone you know. Yeah. <laughs> Research yeah. administration. Yes. Exactly, exactly. Not, not like your mom or anybody like Unless that. they happen to be a research, research administrator, administrator, right? I mean, you know. Yeah. And um, I, I just, uh, I think the data is valuable and I'm really excited about the focus of RAP3 because one of the things that we really need to focus on is what we need to do to get more people into this wonderful, wonderful profession and, um, and, and what we need to do to uh, make it attractive to uh, people around the world. Uh, and um, I, I know Matt, who is our uh, chat room monitor, uh, he was writing to me on the side and said he would really love it if, there, if he had more men to work with as well. So... Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> I don't, I know some people are offended if you even mention gender, but we do have, um, that, uh, statistic that has gone on now for years in the beginning, research administration was primarily men and there were, or it was exactly opposite of what mm. it is now. And it has transitioned over time. Uh, and I think that, uh, in the interest of the profession, uh, it, we really should be, uh, you know, looking at a profession that is like other, like accountancy or something like that and, and see it as something that's open to everyone. So that's, that's what I want to see. Yeah, no, that's a very good point about the, uh, the, the flipping, if you like, from the, uh, uh male or, uh, male dominated as it was back in the, in the fifties, I think that, cause your, your, your data showed that. Um, and I'm just wondering whether that... I alluded to that it's male melt. Male melt. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Is that, is that what happens to you your think... chocolate bar when you put it too close to the fire? When you put it in your mailbox, actually, no, if yeah. you'll, if you look that up, you can see that's a real term and it applies to many different, um, professions. Hmm. So, yeah, but I think it's interesting and it, I don't know how to, how to find out, you know, what is the association, but, um, if we just focus on how to make it more attractive to everyone, that's a good then, point then we're going toward where we want to be, even if we can't explain where we are. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And as you know, Jennifer, there's, uh, uh, there's an ethnicity dimension to that as well. And we will be asking for um, uh, ethnic background in the RAP3 survey to, to hopefully shine some extra light on that. I, I think that's important too. Mm -hmm. It is definitely. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I appreciate everyone uh, being here this morning. I especially appreciate our, our presenters and uh, all the hard work that you've put into RAP and um, the hard work you put into this presentation. And thank you for sharing it with us. And I wish you every success in RAP3. I can't wait to see what it says.